After the release of its first console and the success achieved with Halo, Microsoft knew they needed another game that would be a reason to buy an Xbox 360, an exclusive that would do for the Xbox 360 what Halo did for the original Xbox. And a game with such momentum did come, but it would not be from a first-party studio at Xbox, but from third-party devs. Same studio that today has arguably the biggest game in recent years, Epic Games. Gears of War came out as an exclusive in 2006 for the Xbox 360 and kicked off a franchise that would become an Xbox flagship along with Halo. Driving console sales and growing its loyal fan base, Gears of War has become an important part of the Xbox 360's success. Today we are going to take a look at the history and evolution of Gears of War, from its concept to the latest installment and the future of this franchise. At this point, Epic had two successful games, Unreal, developed by Epic Games, Digital Extremes, yes those who now develop Warframe and Legend Entertainment, and the other title which would bring fame to the studio, Unreal Tournament, a multiplayer based FPS, again developed by Epic and Digital Extremes. Once these two games were released, the Epic Games team began to conceive another game, with classes, mechas, and also focused on multiplayer and arena combat, very much in the style of Unreal Tournament. This project would be called Unreal Warfare. But due to the success of Unreal Tournament, Epic decided to stop the project and concentrate efforts on that title instead of new developments, which left Unreal Warfare on the shelf. James Golding, Epic's lead programmer, mentioned that after years of putting the project on hold and going back to it, the industry was shifting to single player and campaign based games, so they took Unreal Warfare back to the drawing board by renaming it to Just Warfare. The game would go through many names in the development process, but always with the word war in the title. Several changes were made to the game concept over the years, but one of the most important was the change from multiplayer to a single player game loaded with a campaign, character development, and narrative. When lead designer Cliff Blazinski played Medal of Honor, Unreal was heavily focused on online multiplayer, but experiencing Medal of Honor caused Blazinski to shift his focus. That project that had been on hiatus went from a class-based multiplayer game inspired by Team Fortress to a horror game with a romantic story, and then an action title with cover mechanics. Blazinski mentioned in an interview that the game was in influenced by three titles, Resident Evil 4, which left him impressed even before its release in 2005, because he considered that until that moment, many third-person games blocked the field of view with the main character instead of showing what was going on around him, and he saw in Resident Evil 4 a superior handling of this type of camera. The second title is Kill Switch, which has a cover system that he considered the best so far, and the other one, surprisingly, was Bionic Commando. Seeing the movement between different platforms platforms made Blazinski want to make the transition from the aerial movement of this game to a horizontal movement. The change from a first person to a third person game came besides the influence of Resident Evil 4 thanks to the capabilities of Unreal Engine 3, which at the time were impressive. Reason for which the team members came to the conclusion that in the words of Blazinski, it would be criminal not to be able to see the hero. Movement was an important part of the game and how it is transmitted to the player, a department in which the camera again plays a big part. Being a cover-based game, the camera works in different ways to engulf the player. The normal view when you are walking and shooting with a zoom when aiming, the widening of the field of view when taking cover, which allows players to plan their attacks as regards Regardless of the aggressive and violent look of the game, it is more based on an effective attack strategy balanced with a limited arsenal of ammunition, and finally the frenetic movement. When running the camera closes the field of view, which means that you can pay less attention to what is happening around you, just like in real life. But the development team chose to play with the perception of the speed of movement. When you see this, you might think that the character is moving much faster, when in reality, it's only 20% faster to move this way. A wobbly camera helps the feeling of moving much faster than what is really happening. Some things were left out of the game design. A type of concurrency had been conceptualized that would allow the player to buy new weapons and various items, something similar to Resident Evil 4's Merchant, which was left out because it broke the continuity of action in the game. A command system was also removed from the game because this would have made it an 
an RTS, so they decided to remove it. This would have brought very Rainbow Six or Ghost Recon style mechanics to the title. Another thing left out of the game was a morale system, which would influence characters the longer they were in combat, discouraging them as they spent more time under enemy fire. This would bring pressure to the player, as failure to advance from a zone would cause team members to decide to take their lives. Due to the impact this could have on the gameplay, raising the difficulty and hitting the player's morale, they decided to remove it, as difficult sections could become impossible for some players as a result. These changes were made to favor the continuity of action and narrative in the title. The development team was composed of 20 to 30 people, and according to Mark Rain, vice president of Epic Games, it cost around $10 million to produce. A lot of development savings were achieved thanks to Epic not having to pay for an engine, since they were developing on a proprietary one and outsourcing some of the development to Epic Games China. Since the word war was always part of the title, and the influence of Metal Gear on Cliff Blazinski as a designer, the the final title of the game was decided as Gears of War. Due to Epic's history with Unreal Tournament, it was an easy decision to include multiplayer backed by Xbox Live. It was possible to bring several game modes. Warzone, where two teams fight until the respawn opportunity is exhausted. Execution, where the objective is to wipe out the enemy team in a given time. Assassination consists of eliminating the leader of the opposing team, Annex, which would be added in DLC, where the winner is the one who achieves a specific amount of points before the opponent. The game features full split-screen play, allowing friends to enjoy the story in the shoes of the coalition members. In 2005, the game was shown at a closed door event at the Game Developers Conference, mainly as an exhibition of what Unreal Engine 3 could do. It was praised for its realism, suspense, and graphics with excellent clarity, achieved thanks to the pressure that Tim Sweeney, founder of Epic, had on Microsoft, insisting on increasing the RAM of the Xbox 360 from 256 megabytes to 512. If Microsoft wanted to have Gears of War, they had to make this change to the console, Sweeney showed how Gears of War would look running with 256 megabytes of RAM versus 512, which made Microsoft make the decision to change the amount of RAM in its console. The chief financial officer of Microsoft Game Studios at the time commented to Mark Rain that this decision had cost them a billion dollars, to which Rain replied, you have done a billion gamers a favor. In the end, the change required by Gears of War and Tim Sweeney's persuasion to make it allowed the Xbox 360 to run several games much better and to have a 720p resolution in several titles. The advertising campaign for this game was another big investment by Microsoft, who created a mini documentary, Gears of War, The Race to E3, and TV ads. Before the presentation at E3 2006, Xbox executive Peter Moore wanted to remove the Lancer from the demo, a change that would have been disastrous as it caused a big impact, but it was none other than Bill Gates himself who gave the green light saying he loved the chainsaw. The story, for which I will avoid spoilers, consists of the development of a war that has left humanity in a decadent state as a result of the Locust Invasion, a species of humanoid reptiles on Emergence Day declared war on humanity, killing millions of humans. Marcus Phoenix, a member of the Coalition who was imprisoned for defying orders while trying to save his father, Adam, is reinstated to the army and along with his comrades, must stop the Locust threat. The music of this title was created by Kevin Riepel, who had worked in other epic titles, a soundtrack with war effects and an orchestra that enriched the experience and the action within the game. But the title song was composed by Dave Mustaine's Megadeth, which toured with its Gigantor Festival, 25 events sponsored by Microsoft to promote the game. Gears of War was released on November 7, 2006 to critical acclaim, a game that would help drive sales of the Xbox 360, selling 2 million copies in the first four weeks, and with a total of 6 million to date, it was the other killer app on the platform along with Halo. A PC port was released in 2007, with new multiplayer maps and new campaign chapters. At GDC 2007, Epic said they were very interested in bringing a sequel, but actually they were already working on it. A team of 12 programmers and between 15 and 45 artists, depending on the stage of the project, were in charge of making the sequel to the acclaimed game. For this title, they would make some significant changes, starting with the difficulty. Since for Rod Ferguson, the first game was a little more difficult than expected, so modifications were made in this department. As for the music, it went to Steve Jablonski, who had worked on Hollywood movies like Transformers, Pearl Harbor, Ants, and others. Still, Kevin Riepel provided additional music. 
To develop a much more elaborate story, novelist Joshua Ortega, who had under his arm the novel Frequencies and worked on Lost Odyssey, another Xbox 360 exclusive, was brought on board. This brought to the game a much deeper narrative and more character development than in the first installment. The gameplay was improved. Cliff Blazinski mentions that about 400 adjustments were made to the cover system to the responsiveness of the game when aiming or even the blind shot was modified. They improved the code to choose the proper angle in which the player is positioned in the cover mode. The roadie run was improved, name given to this move due to the way roadies run in concerts and the posture they take. Running without ending up stuck to a wall was much easier because in the first game, if you wanted to run through a corridor, it was very likely that the game understood that you wanted to take cover in one of those walls when in reality, you just wanted to run through. And one addition made it very attractive to be among several enemies, the ability to raise a fallen enemy as a shield. Weapons were modified, especially the hammer burst, making it fully automatic and adding a bit of zoom on the scope. The Gorgon pistol was added, which fires high speed bursts. Shields and a grenade launcher were also added, and with it, new executions. Unreal Engine showed improvements in this game, especially in the rendering of water and destructible environments to a moderate degree, in addition to better handling of lights and shadows and more detailed characters, as well as the ability to render hordes of enemies. This was possible because they improved the capabilities of Unreal Engine 3. They added physics of organic objects that could be deformed in real time, which they used for some of the enemies and scenarios, such as the Riftworm. They also created a more immersive and complex destruction system that responded to where the player was shooting and the type of projectile. They also added a crowd system to be able to render over 100 bodies on the screen, which they used for large-scale combat scenes. Demonstrating the power of Unreal Engine 3, by this time, these titles had become a testament to what this engine was capable of. Proven in this game, which was said to be five times bigger in terms of its scenery and the things happening on screen, for Gears 2, they really want to make the game feel like war. Gears 1 was the story of a squad, but this time they wanted to make it look like there was a government. How the COG had their organization that was constantly fighting for the survival of humanity. This is why they added sequences in which you could see other members of this army reach their checkpoints or fight shoulder to shoulder, helping to reflect a larger scale of this conflict. This would need some fun levels to come with it. With this title, they used a method where they created a scenario as a proof of concept and started iterating on what could be done in that scenario. They brainstormed ideas and kept the ones they thought were good and discarded the bad ones. Testing new weapons was also done this way. In fact, the team was very excited about the flamethrower because while flamethrowers have been used in many games, they had never been used in this way with the blind shot and everything. For the story, there was something they were aiming for, to bring in a more human side. The first game had a focus on war primarily. For the sequel, they decided to open with a speech with which, according to Rod Ferguson, they wanted to give more context to the players about what this conflict meant. It wasn't something that was a few weeks old. It wasn't a war in one part of the world. It was a completely global conflict in which humanity has been involved for 94 years. These soldiers were a generation that knew no peace. According to Cliff Blazinski, there was nothing darker than finding the person you love basically incapacitated and doing the only thing you could do for them. So they decided to put Dom in that same situation. In the same way, they put much more emphasis on the friendly relationship between the characters in the game. This increased the amount of cinematics in the title, the amount of dialogue lines, the acting work, and so on. They made the characters more three-dimensional with their lines and mostly with the situations they had to face. This game had motion capture. However, the faces were not captured in the acting scenes. These scenes were recorded and then they were acted with the acting tape over it with the actors making the gestures. So the capture actors were different from the voice actors. As for multiplayer, new modes were added. Wingman, one where five duos take to the battlefield. Guardian, an evolution of assassination mode. Submission, where you must capture a player basically as if he were the flag. A change that modified the multiplayer is the change from eight players in the maps to 10, making two teams of five. But within the added modes, one would become a fan favorite, the Horde mode. The game was released on November 7th, 2008. This time the game would be exclusive to the Microsoft console, as there would not be a port for Windows. The reception was very positive, selling 2 million copies in its first weekend, and consequently it achieved the record of simultaneous players on Xbox Live. 
with more than 1.5 million concurrent users, despite the problems the game had at its launch, due to the fact that it did not have dedicated servers. Those numbers seem small today, but back then they were incredible. To this day, the game has sold 6.75 million units, and it won Best Xbox 360 Game and Best Shooter at the Spike Video Game Awards, which we now know as just the Video Game Awards. Unlike the first two games, which cost $10 and $12 million to develop, according to Tim Sweeney, founder of Epic Games, the third title required an investment of between $48 and $60 million, more than four times what the past games had cost. This information will be key to the future of the franchise. Gears of War was becoming more of a multiplayer game than a campaign one, and due to the problems of the second installment, they knew that this department had to deliver something solid from the beginning. So together with Microsoft, Epic implemented dedicated servers which made all players to be in the same conditions, leveling the multiplayer. They wanted to level it so much that they integrated a system that was a bit controversial, at least for those who knew it existed. This title has the ability to read the player's achievements, so if it didn't find achievements from the first two games, it assumed you were a new player and helped you in multiplayer, giving you more health, doing a little more damage in your first moments in multiplayer. Cliff Blazinski was concerned about making sure that new players wouldn't leave the title quickly and that veterans had a lot to do in the title. So they added unlockables through experience, combined game modes to make the matches have a lot more elements to pay attention to. But by this point, Epic started experimenting with charging extra content, which may be due to the production cost of this latest title. The game featured an unlockable pack costing $10, which included new multiplayer player maps, new skins, and items for horde mode. What caught the attention is that this package had just a 1.4 megabytes Xbox Live download. All this content, it turns out, was on the disc from the beginning. Also in Gears of War 3, you could pay real money to unlock in-game skins. Cliff Blazinski had the idea that they had to bring in systems that would keep players online. They didn't want to end up on the used game shelves or rental shelves. Gears of War had a co-op campaign since the first game, but this time, Epic decided to bring the number of players to four, so four friends can enjoy the campaign with each other. In order to do so, the game suffered a delay. It was planned to be released by Spring 2011, but Epic got six more months to work on the title from Microsoft, which made the game to go until fall of the same year. Graphically, the game improves even more. The illumination is better and is more colorful. This was mainly due to the comments from the community about the second game, which was a bit more gray or pale. For the third installment of Gears of War, the writer was changed. Joshua Ortega left the team to bring Karen Travis, who had worked on Star Wars novels. The change of writers was possible because Cliff Blazinski had the practice of making the story for the game they were developing without leaving all the details on the table. This is how Travis was able to work on the narrative of the third game freely but also it creates inconsistencies and raises questions. For this installment, Marcus goes through several things. This is because Blazinski had talked to the writer of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Joss Whedon, who gave him the show formula. If Buffy suffers, the show is good. So in Gears, if Marcus suffers, Gears is good. During the development of Gears of War 3, the team was certain that it would be the last of this narrative arc. Rod Ferguson said in interviews that this was the last of this story, that they wanted to create an IP that had a lot to tell. Something strange happened during the development of Gears of War 3. They made it run on a PlayStation 3. Not because they were thinking of making a port for that console as many thought, but because they were testing their Unreal Engine on the console. Since at that time, Gears of War had opened the doors to a much larger market, they wanted to make sure to test the capabilities of the engine and that everything would work on Sony's hardware. Gears of War 3 was released on September 20th, 2011 and was received with good reviews and good sales, surpassing the second title and selling 3 million units in its first week, with a total of 6.2 million to date. After three very successful games, the fourth installment would be taken by a different team. Judgment would be the first game where Cliff Blazinski wasn't part of the team for the whole development. The reason being that in 2012, he left Epic Games after 20 years of working there. As a note, Blazinski started working at Epic when he was 18 years old. 
The next Gears of War game was planned to arrive in 2013, with essentially a completely different team working on it. This title was the first one to receive a wave of negativity after its release. It is the first game to fall from a rating higher than 90 on Metacritic. One month after release, the online player base was very low. As for its campaign, it was a prequel to the events of the trilogy. Gears of War had always been a dark game, full of adversity, and with the change of writers, an attempt was made to change this. In addition, the characters and their development were affected. The formula of, if the protagonists suffer, the game is good, which had been used in the last game, was discarded from this title. In terms of gameplay, a stars mode was added, which is basically a rating of how well you perform in the levels. If you achieve a good game, you unlock a mode, declassified, which makes the game more difficult. Another change was that it was limited to only two weapons from the four you could carry in the other games. The mapping of the controls was changed. The horde mode was removed, which many considered a fatal flaw for the game, myself included. The game in general was made a bit more arcadey, which carried over to the multiplayer. The game is in essence easier, trying to make it more accessible to new players, and suffering the same fate as Halo, trying to catch up to the success of games like Call of Duty that amassed huge amounts of players with a much simpler gameplay, at least at first glance. Something interesting is that this game came with a code to download the first game, basically as if Epic was aware that the game was wasn't good enough to justify its price on its own, which many argued, saying it should be more of a DLC than a separate game. The moderate success or failure of this game, whatever you want to call it, led to content support being cut a few months after it hit the market, with only four DLC packs. Judgment arrived on March 19, 2013, and was the game with the lowest sales so far, managing in the month of release to sell 425,000 copies. Compared to the millions of a weekend of its predecessors, this fell far short. To date, it has sold 1.6 million units. In addition, Epic reported that the cost of this game was $60 million, collecting $100 million in sales. After the success of the first two games that cost very little to develop, a third title that cost more but made much more money, Judgment was a blow to Epic's pockets. Many factors play their part in this. The departure of their lead designer, producer, and change of writers and artists are the main ones. After this title, Epic made the decision to sell the franchise to Microsoft, primarily because it was becoming too expensive and could bankrupt them. Estimating that Gears of War 4, a game for the next generation, the Xbox One, was going to cost them over $100 million in development, which, in the words of Tim Sweeney, could have put them out of business if it wasn't a sure success. Part of why this decision was made is that Microsoft rejected Epic's plan to solve Judgment's multiplayer issues in a way that was free to players. So they took the decision to just sell the IP and focus on two games in a free-to-play model they had on the table, a MOBA called Paragon. The other, I think you may know Fortnite, which would come to turn Epic Games into a titan after the implementation of Battle Royale. With Judgment, Epic closed its cycle with the Gears of War saga, but it was not the end for the franchise. After Microsoft bought Epic's IP, rehired Rod Ferguson, producer of the trilogy. Ferguson had left Epic in 2012 to work at Irrational Games, specifically on the final part of their Bioshock Infinite project. And after leaving 2K, Microsoft decided to bring him back. The Black Tusk Studio, a Microsoft game studio subsidiary, was in charge of Gears of War now while Epic bought People Can Fly, a studio that had been helping them on the Gears of War trilogy and developed Judgment. Black Tusk would be renamed to The Coalition, just as 343 took its name from an element of Halo, The Coalition was chosen to emphasize the studio's commitment to this franchise. Although this studio did not start development on Gears of War 4, Epic had already done work on this game, which was continued by the Coalition. Meanwhile, they put a team of about 100 people to make the ultimate edition of Gears of War, a remake of the first game. This remake was released on August 25th, 2015, and has sold 3.6 million copies, as well as being available on Xbox Game Pass, along with all the other games of the franchise. Ferguson explains that when work began on Gears of War 4, the Coalition team started talking about doing things differently. Things like getting verticality into the game and introducing things they hadn't seen in the franchise. Fortunately, Ferguson's job was to tell the team, we need to stop. Let's work on the remake of the first one. Let's go back to basics and see what it is about the Gears experience to do it right before we do it differently. 
Once the team understood what a Gears of War game was, Ferguson mentions that they began talks of putting innovation into the formula. The team got feedback on what they were doing from Cliff Blazinski, thanks to his friendship with Ferguson, and advice from Jim Brown, an important part of the Gears of War multiplayer from the early games. He even visited the studio and had extensive work sessions, helping them tweak levels and maps. Ferguson had the team play the four previous games and read novels, and even did trivia with some prizes for the team members, all to try to immerse them in the Gears of War experience and universe. For the multiplayer of Gears of War Ultimate Edition, the Coalition had the support of Splash Damage, who already had experience in working with multiplayer sections of games like Doom 3, Return to Castle Wolfenstein, and helped with the development of Brink the Bethesda game, and in the multiplayer mode of Batman Arkham Origins, with this experience, Rod Ferguson felt that they would be a good addition to his team. This would be the beginning of a relationship that would last for several titles. The development of Gears of War 4 would take two and a half years and was done in Unreal Engine 4. At the beginning of this development, the team at the Coalition was still aiming to do something new. A comment from Rod Ferguson caused concern among fans, as in an interview with the official Xbox magazine he mentioned that in order to give the fans something new, they needed to betray them. But not so much that it would disconnect them from the franchise, and that's what they were concentrating on. During the early conceptualization of Gears of War 4, Black Tusk, because at that time the Coalition had not yet been formed, thought about whether they should do an alternate history, a spin-off, or an origin story, redefining Marcus for future games, but in the end they left that out of the table as they felt it would be disrespectful to what had been done with the original trilogy. Through all of their ideas, they came to the conclusion that it should be a story of inheriting a legacy. In fact, at the beginning, instead of the one who ended up being the main character, J.D. Fenix, the game was going to have Marcus Phoenix's daughter at the center, but they wanted to have a strong female character, which came in the form of Kate Diaz. As for the setting, they also thought they could go to another planet to continue the story, but there were still several things to answer from the original trilogy, so centering the story elsewhere could make it feel like it missed these kinds of details. They couldn't go to familiar places, couldn't talk to Marcus and his friends, among other things. Ferguson mentions that Judgment served as a cautionary tale for what not to do in this regard. Another challenge was to transfer everything that was Gears of War to Unreal Engine 4, since according to to the producer, many things could not be transferred directly. The movement, speed, combat, and especially the artificial intelligence, so the team had to constantly reiterate to make it feel like Gears. Again, they worked with Splash Damage to test the new things, because if something got into the story, they had to find out how that new enemy or some new weapon had to be tested in a multiplayer environment and see how they would integrate it. For the development team, it was important that the story and multiplayer elements were cohesive. Matt Searcy, design lead for the Gears of War 4 campaign, mentioned that they wanted to bring in new things, but they had to make sure that they didn't feel different, that even though they were new weapons, players had a sense of how to use them thanks to their past experience. As for the acting, the Coalition did something different from how they had worked before. The characters' lines were previously recorded separately. Each actor would come in and do their lines separately. This time, they put them all together in the booth depending on who appeared in the scene, of course. And they had to act and interact with each other in real time. This resulted, according to the designer and the producer, in a more natural interaction and even some improvised lines. And that's how the Coalition started to create a new story, trying to integrate both old characters, locations, and other things that would make players feel like they were still in a Gears game with a new direction. As a sign that this was a new era, a new omen was used, changing the Crimson Omen to the Phoenix Omen. The game focuses on Marcus's son, JD Phoenix, and Marcus, who must deal with new challenges in Sarah after the events of the trilogy, where the cities are protected by walls, where the cog helps the survival of humanity with a little fascist edge, but soon encounters a new threat. As for multiplayer, for many, this aspect had become more important than even the campaign, so the coalition needed to pay attention to this area under new modes such as 
dodgeball, where if you die, you depend on a teammate to make an elimination to return to the field, escalation, which consists of dominating zones to earn points, and a change to horde mode where there is a progression system. These systems allowed Microsoft, as in Halo, the opportunity to introduce microtransactions, to which the community reacted negatively in part. Controversy arose from this. The loot box system makes it possible to obtain characters and cosmetic accessories. The game has had no DLC in terms of story. The $50 season pass was for multiplayer only, giving you access to gear packs, which are randomized, access to series cards, cosmetics, but what raised eyebrows was the skill cards for Horde mode the gear pack system, which are basically loot boxes, has been criticized and that there was the possibility of getting duplicates. As in Halo 5, the time investment to get all the skins is ridiculous. The direction the coalition took with multiplayer has been a topic of conversation, with many calling it greedy and others left hanging for more story DLC to get answers raised in the campaign. The game came out on October 11th, 2016 for Windows and Xbox One with rave reviews, but short to past games. And as for its first week, it sold an estimated 620,000 copies, leaving it well below past titles. Xbox has been very quiet with its numbers from the 8th generation, both in hardware and player sales. However, the Coalition accidentally revealed that over 6 million players have experienced Gears of War 4, and with the game's inclusion in Game Pass, surely this number has risen, and with a micro transaction system like the one it has, surely they generated money from those Game Pass users. At E3 2018, the Coalition had announced the next step in the franchise, one that involves focusing on a new character and her story, Kate Diaz. But that wouldn't be the only big change for the game. Gears 5 would include open areas, not an open world, but open areas where the player would have to transport from one location to another to accomplish campaign objectives. Within these areas would basically be some of the game's levels. This came after the team started prototyping the game's rest moments, which are sequences like the motorcycle scene from Gears 4 or any vehicle sequence that gives a break from the normal Gears action we saw in past installments. Matt Searcy, who would again be the campaign design director, mentioned in an interview with GameBrain that within these prototypes they created the skiff, a vehicle propelled by a sail, and that when Rod Ferguson was testing this prototype inside one of their worlds, he said, I want to go that way, pointing to a direction that was not planned in the game. This made the team open up the possibility of creating an open world, albeit with their own approach. This fulfilled one of their desires to add more exploration to the franchise. Searcy mentioned that during development, they began to see how other games implemented these elements in an interesting way that adhered to the style of those titles. Mentioning 2018's God of War and Rise of the Tomb Raider as influences, they actually had talks about this with the developers of Tomb Raider thanks to the creation of the initiative within Xbox. In fact, at the beginning, the skiff had the ability to shoot, there was built-in combat to the vehicle, but in the end, they decided not to implement it in the game, even though it was almost ready. That's why the model has a turret mounted, although it is never used. This was to have those rest sections, so that the combat would give space to exploration, to give the characters opportunity to have conversations about what was happening in the story. But now that they had an open world and wanted more exploration, there was the question of how they would make this navigation more intuitive. What would they integrate to make exploration rewarding? They couldn't just have an open world for the sake of it. Nick Letizia was in charge of solving this. He was given the role of overworld design lead, a new position within the studio, as they had never done anything open world before. Letizia was tasked with convincing the Xbox higher-ups that this direction was the right one, and to do so, he was inspired by a talk he saw at the 2017 GDC where he witnessed a Nintendo talk about Breath of the Wild, which inspired him to write the document that defined the way they will continue in this new path. When designing the open world and the side quests within it, Nick Letizia gave the team a task. They had to make these quests something different from the traditional Gears battles, offer something that required the completion of some objective using acquired skills, among other things. When they started creating these missions and started crafting the rewards for them, that's when Jack's skills started to appear on the scene. At the end of the day, it made sense that if we explored, you would discover technology that your little robot friend could make use of. This gave players who decided to explore more tools to deal with threats 
but they would not be mandatory for those who didn't want to, as they didn't want to fall into a grind just to extend the length of the game. They weren't making an open world game as such, more like a Gears with exploration. Their philosophy was to avoid as much as possible doing fetch quests and a lot of things that artificially extend the game's length. Among all these open world tropes, they wanted to avoid fast travel. Instead, they were to design the open world in such a way that players could accomplish quests while being transported from one objective to another and not fetch quests from one corner of the map to another and then back again. Hence the goal of avoiding missions in which you are running errands. But with the open areas came another challenge. How to make the story feel like it was always moving forward if they were going to make secondary areas or areas that could be completed in different order, would these be separate from the story? They solved this by creating sequences that advanced the main narrative during side missions, but they designed them, in Matt Searcy's words, in a way that regardless of the order, you can understand what's going on. Like Kate's hallucination section, it doesn't matter which one you see first, they all make sense in the end. As for the story, it was established that the shift in focus would be towards Kate. This is explained by Rod Ferguson comparing Gears 4 to Mad Max, Fury Road. While many might think it's about Max, in reality, the focus of the story is on Furiosa, and Max is her companion. Gears 4 is about saving Kate's mom, and JD is helping her. The Coalition had it clear that Kate would be the protagonist of Gears 5 since they were making the fourth installment. This time, they wanted to make a game that took place in a longer period of time in the game's universe. All previous Gears games had been almost continuous events. For example, the events of Gears 4 took place in little more than a day. This time around, there is even a four-month jump within the game. In this particular title, they worked on making it as accessible as possible, trying to maintain an adequate difficulty curve and difficulty options for veteran users. But in this regard, Ferguson mentions that they had to consider that many users would experience it through Game Pass, which had the potential to get people who had never played a Gears to do so now that it could be enjoyed with the subscription and not paying full price. But they did not want to put tutorials in the game since, according to the producer, they could not put veteran players to repeat their learning or spend time that they could spend in the story explaining how to play, so they integrated the boot camp. Another outcome of this philosophy was the multiplayer arcade mode in which new players will be able to learn the mechanics in moderately paced matches instead of immediately facing players doing wall bouncing when they don't even know what the name means. Also with this in mind, they integrated Jack as a character in the hordes, which is basically a support character. This time they added a cooperative mode, Escape, where players worked side by side in groups of three to escape from a hive. It was like an extraction mode, but with the gears touch. As for the multiplayer, they tried to adjust so that it wasn't just shotguns, adjusting maps and weapon damage to make it more attractive for players to use other weapons. Gears 5 was released on September 10th, 2019. It was well received, although in places like the UK, it sold almost five times less in physical than Gears of War 4. This is attributed to two things, increased digital sales and the fact that it came out on Game Pass. It was reported that in its first weekend, it was played by 3 million people, being the biggest Game Pass release release up to that point. It is estimated that Gears 5, like Gears 4, cost over $100 million during its development. This is a huge difference from the $12 million of the first game. On December 20th, after the game got its SNX series version, the DLC Hive Busters was released where the story focuses on the Scorpio Squadron from the comic book of the same name. This DLC is a prequel to the events of that comic. Another thing, before Gears 5, a game called Gears Pop was released, a mobile strategy game, but it took Gears of War to a look known to many, the Funko Pops. This game was received poorly and shut down a little time after release. The next step would be one that no one expected. Steve Venezia, a designer at Splash Damage, decided to take Gears into a genre that while it had had very little exposure to the general public, had found new life after XCOM revived with Enemy Unknown, strategy games but more focused on squad-based combat. This wouldn't be the franchise's first attempt to enter the strategy space though. At one point, Epic Games was working on something called Gears of War Tactics an RTS set in the Gears universe, which was intended to be controlled with the Kinect. 
This project was never announced and ended up cancelled without knowing with certainty why. However, the Splash Damage team wanted to take Gears into strategic territory, and with the support of the Coalition, they sought authorization for this project. Tyler Bielman, the Coalition's Director of Advertising Design, sold the idea to Xbox, saying that a strategy game would go perfectly with the franchise. In an interview with PC Games, he mentioned that his pitch was that Gears has cover-based, platoon-focused tactical combat, and that if you saw it from an overhead camera, it all made sense. This was something that the team at the Coalition and Xbox were in complete agreement on. The first thing they did was create a tabletop game. Steve Venezia mentioned that creating a board game with just paper, a pencil, and a few figures helped them see how to translate the mechanics of normal Gears of War games to a strategic field. This helped them to know how to create character movements, how they should design the levels, and how the player should be able to read the battlefield. They saw themselves creating scenarios where players had to repair a vehicle while fending off a horde of locusts, both from the sides and ones that appeared from underground. This was the design's first approach to cooperative missions. During the different tests they performed, they realized that a single scenario could lead to different outcomes and different ways to play it, especially if they worked the AI in a good way, which would allow replayability even when the map didn't change. But at this point in development, they were still thinking of doing the movement in the classic style, with moves like chess pieces limited to a certain range within a grid. Inspired by games like Warhammer 40,000, they changed to a model without a grid, completely free. This was not an easy decision, as there were fears that this would make the design and overall development of the game much more difficult. According to Steve Venezia, this turned out in giving players much more freedom and flexibility, which added up to a more natural and integrated gameplay with the Gears universe. To make it feel more Gears-like, they took the design of the tactical games and picked up the pace a bit. They wanted the player to enter combat quickly, taking just a few turns to start generating damage and taking it. After all, Gears itself is tactical, but it's also fast. They also provided different abilities that allow the player to do more things in a single turn than in other games in the genre, giving much more action to tactics. To complement this, they had to put a system of upgrades and builds in the game in order to increase the abilities of the units in the game. In order to do this, according to Bielman, they took the best from RPGs, tactics games, and the Gears universe to create an amalgamation. This ultimately led to the skill tree we see available for Gears units. As for the story, they decided early on that this title would be canonical, and a prequel that added to the lore of the Gears universe answering some questions of how some enemies were created and most important, by whom. Gears Tactics took four and a half years to develop. It sounds like a lot, but you have to consider that Splash Damage and the Coalition were also working on Gears of War 4 and what would come later, Gears 5. Throughout its development and subsequent announcement, Gears Tactics was always treated as a PC game, but shortly after it was announced that it would be coming to Xbox sometime later, with the PC version launching in April 2020 and on Xbox One Series S and X on November 10th of the same year. Gears Tactics was well received by gamers, and there are some who would like to see a sequel to it, but for the moment, nothing has been announced. As for the future of the franchise as of today, it is known that they are working on a new installment because it would be the natural thing to do. It is what the Coalition exists for. There was a demo of what the Coalition was doing with Unreal Engine 5, but it was made very clear this did not represent any work in progress. But you can see that graphically they have made a leap. Also, it was recently revealed that People Can Fly is working together with Microsoft to create a game with a budget of between $30 million and $50 million from one of their IPs called Project Maverick. Since this studio created the spin-off, many believe that they are again creating something for the Gears franchise. But this has not been officially revealed either. But potentially, two Gears projects are being developed at the moment. We can only wait for them to be officially revealed. And this is the full story of Gears of War, at least so far. Which one's your favorite? What direction would you like to see the franchise taking? Leave your comments. Thanks for your time. You can follow me on X and see other content released on this channel. I've reached 1,000 subscribers now and I can't thank you enough. Thanks again. I'm Alex and I'll see you next time.